Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful Saturday afternoon to support your family or friend. I'm Rick Arsenault. I'm a clinical professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine from St. Paul's Hospital at UBC. And today we're going to be talking about ME, CFS, FM, long COVID, and related disorders. The problem with these conditions is that they're invisible. And when you have an invisible disability, you'll often be treated as if you're lazy, crazy, or faking it. So a lot of patients actually have a bad history of being gaslighted. One of the things I used to do with my medical students, I used to get them to play a free association game. And I would say, when I say chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, what comes to mind? And they would say it's psychological or psychiatric. It's not real. There's nothing you can do. It's frustrating and unsatisfying to take care of these patients. And then when I asked them, how much teaching have you had in medical school about this? At the time, the answer was invariably none. In a report in 2015, two thirds of medical schools across North America did not have or even mentioned this in their curriculum. I don't have any more recent data, but I'm hoping with long COVID that this will change. When I was the director of program planning at BC Women's Hospital at the Complex Chronic Diseases Program, my main goal in working with students was not to get them to learn the doses of medications or criteria for diagnosis. It was to change their attitude. I wanted them to realize that this is not psychological or psychiatric. It is real. There's lots you can do for these patients. And rather than frustrating and unsatisfying, it's actually very satisfying to take care of this patient population. So yes, it's real, but is it rare? This is a report out of Statistics Canada released in March of 2017. And it talks about medically unexplained physical symptoms. And this is an older term, and I'm only referring to it because this is what was used in the report. But you can see here that what they mean by medically unexplained symptoms is chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, multiple chemical sensitivities. What they found was that 5.5% of Canadians or an estimated one in 20 Canadians have these conditions. To look at the economic impact, fewer than 45% of these patients were employed. And this has a huge implication for the ongoing COVID pandemic. So these patients, they're common. They use up a lot of medical resources. Here you can see, compared to the general population, how, how they use the resources. So 10 or more GP visits, specialists consulted, mental health services, other consultations, overnight hospitalizations. These patients actually try and get a lot of care, but unfortunately that care is usually unsatisfying because not a lot is known by many physicians about these conditions. So you would think that if this is a relatively common condition, that the research funding should match. So here is a slide out of 2013. And on the bottom, on the x-axis, it's a daily. So this is disability adjusted life years. And as you move from right to left, this tells you diseases that have a bigger and bigger impact on a person's quality of life. If you look on the y-axis, the thing to note here is that this is not a regular axis. It's a logarithmic axis, which means that you go from 1 million to 10 million, to 100 million, to 1 billion, to 10 billion. And overall, when you plot a line of best fit, you can see that 
on average, that the higher the burden of disease, the more money gets spent on research. But that's on the average. If you actually look at specific diseases, so let's look at HIV AIDS. So they get about five billion with the B dollars. If you look at chronic fatigue syndrome, they get about $5 million. This was in 2013. And if you look at if they were completely fair and on this line, both of them would get around 200 to $250 million. So it's not surprising that with only $5 million a year, that the amount of knowledge and research that we have on these conditions is infinitesimally small. The good news is that with long COVID, uh, $1.15 billion has been earmarked in the US for long COVID research and clinical trials. And we're already seeing some of that information come down the pipeline. So patients with these conditions tend to have five overlapping symptoms. They have fatigue, pain, brain fog, sleep problems and unexplained symptoms. And those unexplained symptoms tend to be in the gut, the CNS, the brain, or the autonomic nervous system, which is the adrenaline uh, nervous system, adrenaline parasympathetic. The problem is it's often difficult to identify these patients because over 200 different symptoms have been reported. And it makes it quite confusing unless you see a lot of these patients. But when you reorganize your thinking into categories of symptoms of fatigue, pain, brain fog, sleep disturbance, and unexplained symptoms, it's much easier to identify the pattern of disease. The other issue is that these conditions rarely occur in isolation, that there's usually some overlap. And here's a study that looked at patients with fibromyalgia, and you can see that 40% of them had irritable bowel syndrome, almost 20% of them had temporomandibular disorder, about 25% had headaches, et cetera, et cetera. And over here, you can see that 55% of the patients with fibromyalgia also had chronic fatigue syndrome, ME. I think this is an underestimate. In my practice, I noticed that about 70 to 75% of patients have both ME and fibromyalgia. So these conditions are called central sensitivity syndromes. And it's just a family name. Some people take issue with the name central sensitivity syndrome. I don't think it's a big deal because either way, whether you like the name or dislike the name, it, all it says is that these conditions tend to run together. And you can see the common ones here, ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, myofascial pain syndrome, migraines, tension headaches, irritable bowel syndrome, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, also known as POTS, interstitial cystitis, pelvic pain syndrome, PTSD, non-cardiac chest pain slash costochondritis, temporomandibular disorder, also known as TMJ, irritable larynx syndrome, and something called central abdominal pain syndrome. Some doctors still refer to this as functional abdominal pain syndrome. And those of you who know doctor code, functional usually means there's nothing wrong or it's psychiatric. On average, in my practice, I see five to six central sensitivity syndromes in an individual. The range I see is one to 14 of these conditions. Only rarely do I see one. And if I do only see one, it's usually a milder version. Most of my patients with ME or FM have five to six. And interestingly, this also applies to my patients with long COVID. So this is adapted from Dr. Eunice, who introduced this concept. And he recently had an editorial reminding us that it's central sensitivity syndromes with an S at the end. Because this is not a syndrome. This is simply a family name for conditions that run together. And here they're organized in a different way. It's thought that central sensitization might be a common phenomenon 
And whether or not that's true, whether or not we find that it's a different thing that unifies these in the future, doesn't really matter. What matters is that they tend to occur together. As research moves forward, we'll hopefully have a lot more of an understanding about how these conditions connect. Because these conditions are syndrome-based, which means that they don't have a diagnostic marker, except for a couple of them. So when I explain this to my students, I tell them that the majority of symptoms can explain be explained on two bases. The first is amplification. And so think of this as the volume on your stereo. And the volume is turned up. So patients with these conditions are often sensitive to light, sensitive to sound, sensitive to smell, sensitive to medications, sensitive to touch and pain, et cetera, et cetera. The second thing that happens is distortion. Some of you may be old enough to remember when TVs had antennas, and if there was snow or interference or noise on the TV, we didn't call the TV repairman because we knew it was a problem with reception. There's nothing wrong with the hardware. And this is what happens in patients with these conditions with the brain fog, it's brain noise. And so sometimes that manifests as problems with focus of vision, double vision, ringing in the ears, sensation of bugs crawling under the skin, problems with balance, feeling like you're walking on a boat. And so one of my students said it really well. He said, so you mean it's kind of like a software problem than a hardware problem. And I've been using this metaphor for decades, but as it turns out, increased brain noise and problems with brain synchronization is actually at the root of these problems. So it's just, it's not just a metaphor. So a number of symptoms have been described. We said over 200, but the main ones I said fall into the categories of fatigue, pain, sleep disturbance, brain fog, and unexplained symptoms. So imagine that you get a, a flu. You know how you feel with the flu. Your brain's not working properly. Your muscles are achy. You're sleepy. It's hard for you to get motivated to do anything. And usually this would get better within a week or two. But imagine that it continues for a month, two months, three months, six months, and even a year. At this point, you're starting to get worried. You see your doctor, all the blood tests come back normal. And so you may be told that there's nothing wrong. What your physician actually means is we can't find anything because there's a huge difference between there's nothing wrong and we can't find anything. Doctors as a profession have a very short history. They forget about the fact that Multiple sclerosis was thought to be a psychological disease until the MRI was invented. So you get the tests back, they don't find any abnormalities. You feel like you've gone for a long run, your muscles are achy. The more that you try and get help, the more that you find that your symptoms are getting worse. Some of the doctors are even kind of say that maybe this is in your head. And some of you may actually be formally diagnosed with psychiatric issues like somatoform disorder. You get bad advice. You get told to push through your symptoms. And as you push through your symptoms and you try and do more, you realize that you're getting worse. But nobody seems to believe it or to understand that when you push, you actually make yourself worse. And so all the things that we know about, you know, improving your mood, improving your pain, improving your energy level by exercising actually falls to the wayside with these conditions. On average, it takes a patient about five years to get a diagnosis. The longest I've seen is a patient who got, went undiagnosed for over 40 years. I've seen a patient who saw 17 different specialists in this province and still did not have a diagnosis. So you can see that despite 
costing a lot of money to the system and spending a lot of money on these patients that the quality of the care that they get is not optimal. So when I think about these conditions, I think about what predisposes you? Who's more likely to get this? What precipitates it? Because not everybody who's predisposed will go on to develop these symptoms. And what perpetuates it or makes it worse? So for predisposing factors, we know that there's definitely a genetic contribution. Twin studies show that 50% of identical twins will both have ME or FM, whereas only 25% of fraternal or non-identical twins will both have it. I don't see a lot of twins, but what I do see are family members. And often I see it's my daughter rather than my mother who has this because these diagnoses weren't made in the past. So the history tends to be more downstream than upstream. The other thing that is found to be predisposing for these conditions is what's called adverse childhood events or childhood trauma. When you're a kid, you should be like a lion cub in the savannah. It should be like Lion King. You should have no worries. Mom and dad should be watching, should be playing. You shouldn't be like a gazelle. You shouldn't be on high alert all the time, looking over your shoulder, worried about possible threat. There's something about being on high alert during childhood that predisposes you to develop medical conditions in the future. And so the ACE study or the Adverse Childhood Experience study showed that the degree of risk correlates very well with the number of adverse childhood experiences. The higher the number of adverse childhood experiences, the higher the risk for developing medical conditions. What they included as adverse childhood experiences include abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And if you look at this list, you'll realize that it is not complete. They didn't include bullying. They didn't include racism. They didn't include homophobia, misogyny, anti-trans, anything that would make you stressed and on high alert as a kid. So it's not just ME and FM or long COVID that you're predisposed to. It's a whole host of medical conditions including obesity, diabetes, all the way to stroke and broken bones. A recent study looked at the role of psychological factors in developing these risks. And so over here, you can see that the looked at stressors such as domestic violence, sexual abuse, physical abuse, et cetera, et cetera. And as predicted, over the long term, this causes changes in the hypothalamic pituitary axis. We'll talk about this later. But the HPA axis is the part of the brain that is in charge of the stress response. It triggers the hormonal component of the, the stress response, which we'll have a look at later. Okay, so we know who's more likely to get this, who's predisposed. There's a genetic component, adverse childhood experiences. But like we said, not all, all patients or all individuals who are predisposed develop these conditions. There's usually a stressor. And this stressor can be cumulative over time, kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back, or it can be all of a sudden, like getting COVID. The precipitants, the stressors, fall into three main categories. There's physical stressors like a car accident, surgery, a fall. There's psychological stressors like event PTSD, a home invasion, or burnout, or chronic stress. Infections are also a common precipitant, and this can be any infection, although most of the research has been done on viral infections. And it's important to differentiate a precipitant versus a cause. I 
spent a lot of time helping de defend patients uh, with medical legal uh, reports and going to court because they look normal. So the insurers believe that they're, like I said, lazy, crazy, or faking it. And the definition of cause has a very different meaning in medicine than it does in legal speak. And so when we're talking about a precipitate here, we're talking about what triggers it. And so over here, we have a gun and there's something that pulls the trigger. And like we said, that predisposition is having the gun. The trigger is pulling the trigger. And we said that's physical psychological or infectious. And so I'll give you an analogy to differentiate between a cause and a precipitant. And so for instance, a forest fire, the cigarette may be the cause or the trigger, but it's not the cause of the ongoing forest fire. And so once the cigarette is left to do its business or the campfire, the lightning strike, we can't undo those. We can't undo a lightning strike. We're left with the mess of the forest fire after the fact. So you can't undo or fix a precipitant. And so this becomes important in people who have an infectious cause because there's a large group of people who after they develop these conditions, because the symptoms overlap with feeling like you have an infection, some people will believe that they have a chronic undiagnosed infection. And this is particularly prominent in the Lyme population, where patients with chronic Lyme disease believe that they have ongoing Lyme infection. The alternative interpretation is that Lyme, like any other infection, can trigger these conditions. In fact, a study done by the group at BC Women's Hospital showed that there was no difference between patients with chronic Lyme disease and chronic fatigue syndrome. This is a famous study done in Australia called the Dubo study. And this was done in an infectious disease clinic and what they did is they looked at the patients that came to their clinic and followed them. And what they found was that 11% of patients went on to fulfill criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, at six months. And it didn't matter which infection they had. So what was happening is that some people, the host, was responding to the infection in a way that led to the chronic fatigue syndrome. It wasn't particular to the infection. And that's why many of us knew that about 10% of patients with COVID would go on to fulfill criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome after the infection. But doctors like to give new names to things. And so here's one called post Ebola virus disease syndrome. If you look at the symptoms that are underlined, it's pain, fatigue, sleep disturbance, brain fog, and unexplained symptoms. So in this case, it's not a separate condition. It's simply chronic fatigue syndrome that's been triggered by Ebola virus. Here's another article that talks about Lyme, just like we said. And here they're calling it post-treatment Lyme syndrome and central sensitization. But the patients with chronic Lyme disease tend to have symptoms of fatigue, pain, sleep disturbance, and brain fog and unexplained symptoms. And the vast majority of them fulfill criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome and or fibromyalgia. So the problem with a syndrome is that it's based on criteria. And it means you either have it or you don't, which is artificial. Because in reality, diseases exist along a spectrum. It's kind of like you can have pre-diabetes before you get full-blown diabetes, and the severity of your diabetes can get worse. So there's a spectrum. With these conditions, we either say you fulfill criteria or you don't. 
when in reality, some patients will have a mild version, but not fulfill criteria. And so this is how some of us, including the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, think about long COVID. It's a post-viral syndrome. Some patients will have a milder version, such as the teens or young adults that get mono and are out of commission for six months to a year, but then bounce back. But some patients will have a full-blown uh, event that will lead them to fulfill criteria for ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, and or fibromyalgia. These patients are much less likely to have a partial or full remission compared to the patients who have a milder post-viral syndrome. So in fact, long COVID is not new. We actually didn't even need the name long COVID because post-viral syndromes have been around for a long time and we've known about them. We also know that many of those patients go on to fulfill criteria for ME and FM. So like I said, at the beginning of the pandemic, many of my colleagues and I predicted that about 10% of patients would go on to develop ME and FM as a result of COVID. We expected that they would have symptoms of fatigue, pain, brain fog, sleep disturbance, and unexplained symptoms. They would have gut symptoms, they would have brain symptoms, and they would have autonomic symptoms. And the big one that we see in these patients is called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And if you're interested, there is a special lecture that I did on this on YouTube. So we were surprised when we read articles that said COVID long haulers stump experts. They shouldn't have been stumped because we know what it is. And so, unfortunately, like the patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, these symptoms are invisible. One of the things that I had expected and predicted and was completely wrong on was that medical gaslighting wouldn't happen in this patient population given all of the press. However, this turned out not to be the fact. And here in this article, you can see the quote. It says, many long haulers never had laboratory confirmation of COVID, which they say adds to some healthcare professional skepticism that their persistent symptoms have a physiological basis. These mystery diagnoses are real. They are not just in patients' head. They are post-viral syndrome. The Solve ME initiative is a group of researchers who have been collecting blood and have a biobank, and they're comparing COVID to ME. And it'll be interesting to see how they differ, because remember, ME is probably a cluster of possibly different conditions with a common final pathway in that those who develop ME after an infection may be different than those who develop it after a psychological or physical injury. Unfortunately, here's an article by somebody saying, ah, oh, this long COVID, it's not real. And so a contested illness is born. Doctors are arguing about whether or not this is psychological. And like I said, as a profession, doctors have a very short memory. They fall into what I call the Sherlock Holmes fallacy. Some of you may or may not know that Sherlock Holmes, the author, was a doctor. And if you've read any of Sherlock Holmes, you'd know that Sherlock Holmes saying is that once you've ruled out every possibility, whatever is left, no matter how unlikely, is the answer. There's a fatal flaw to that thinking. It assumes that all of the possibilities are known at the outset, which is completely wrong. And so doctors fall into this fallacy because they believe once we rule out everything that we know about, whatever's left must be psychological. 
they forget that MS, multiple sclerosis, used to be a psychological illness until we invented the MRI. And so more often than not, what we have is simply a lack of sophisticated enough science to identify these disorders, and they unfortunately get labeled as psychiatric, somatic, or functional. Here is an interview that I did on medical gaslighting that was written by Dr. Anthony Fong. And for those of you who are interested, there is a link to it on the title page of my website. So as the pandemic progressed, we were getting more and more information. And finally, people were starting to notice the high degree of similarities between long COVID and ME. And here, just like many people around the world, they estimated that 10% of patients with COVID may develop ME-CFS. And so one of the things we're gonna have to do is to describe what long COVID means because there seems to be a lot of contradictory information in the news and in science. And it's not that the information is contrary, it's that the definition that different doctors and different researchers use to describe long COVID varies. So here's another article and it looked at fibromyalgia. And these authors say, hey, did you realize that 30% of patients with long COVID fulfill criteria for FM, fibromyalgia? We should call this fibro-COVID. No, we have no need for a new name. We've known for a long time that viruses can trigger fibromyalgia. And it turns out that COVID, like any other virus, can trigger fibromyalgia. So how do we define long COVID? All I can tell you is how I define it. And when you read research, if you see something that seems contradictory to what I've said or to what other research has said, look at how it's defined. I define it the same way that the Mayo Clinic does in Rochester, Minnesota. There's a, there's a name called PASC, post-acute sequelae of COVID. And PASC is a fancy way of saying anything that goes wrong after you recover from the COVID infection. And so the group in at the Mayo Clinic, they think of PASC as an umbrella term for different categories. Whereas some doctors and even the Canadian government often use PASC to be equivalent to long COVID. I don't think that's the right approach. So the three groups that have been identified are patients with tissue damage. And these are easy for doctors to deal with because they've dealt with these before. These are patients with lung scarring, problems with their heart, loss of taste and smell, blood clots. And so those patients have overt tissue damage that can be identified. The second group is those with no identifiable tissue damage. And the group at the Mayo Clinic identifies that these patients have fatigue, pain, sleep disturbance, brain fog, and unexplained symptoms. So they say this is the group that represents post-viral syndrome. They, they also think that this represents a central sensitivity syndrome. What's interesting is in their study, they excluded patients with pre-existing central sensitivity syndromes. One of the things that I've predicted and that has been pretty consistent in my practice is that most patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, either have pre-existing central sensitivity syndromes or develop extra ones after getting COVID. So they may have irritable bowel syndrome that gets worse. They may have migraines that get worse, et cetera, et cetera. The third group is psychiatric and psychological impact of COVID. 
Some patients will develop anxiety. Some patients will develop depression. Some patients will develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And so if we look at these three categories, it's category number two, the no identifiable tissue damage that represents long COVID according to the Mayo Clinic. And that's how I think about it in my practice. I don't accept referrals with, from doctors when the patient has lung scarring or any other tissue damage, because those patients are better served by the specialists who have expertise in those areas. So patients with lung scarring need to see a respirologist. Patients with heart disease need to see a heart specialist, a cardiologist. The problem is that sometimes patients can have one or more of these. So it's not or one, two, or three. It can be one and two and three. So one of the things I used to do with my patients group, my patient groups, I run an 18-week patient group for patients with these conditions. And to get them to get the idea of how disabling these conditions are, I would say. If I could wave a magic wand and I could cure your chronic fatigue, your ME, your FM, and put you in a wheelchair for the rest of your life, would you accept that Faustian uh, trade? The vast majority of patients say no. If you asked me, I would pick the wheelchair in less than a second. Because if I were in a wheelchair, I could still practice medicine. I could still be presenting this. I could still read, which is one of my joys in life. Whereas if I had bad chronic fatigue syndrome, I may not be able to do any of those. On top of that, if you have, if you are in a wheelchair, nobody asks you why you can't walk. Nobody asks you to stand up and reach for something because your disability is visible. There's also a special bus. There's also special bathrooms. And so you're better integrated into society. Patients with ME and FM, actually, because their conditions are invisible, sometimes they have a hard time integrating into society because most people don't believe that they're ill. One of the issues is that when they go outside and they meet people, it's usually because they're doing better that day. And also, they put effort into looking good. One of my patients said it really well. She said, when everybody thought I was faking being sick, I was actually faking being well. So let's look at some of the symptoms. Let's start with fatigue. Again, invisible condition. People talk to you, they don't see it. They often make assumptions about what you can and can't do and what you're doing on disability. I had one patient who was outside his home and his neighbor came by, was going home from work. And he said to my patient, must be nice living the life of Riley. My patient was not living the life of Riley. My patient was mostly bedbound, often housebound, and when he when he did go out, only had a very short window where he could do stuff. Patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia often tell me that fatigue is not a perfect word to describe how they're feeling. It's not just more of fatigue, but there's a difference. They talk about a heaviness. And that's why I put that picture at the beginning of my talk, which showed a woman with concrete blocks for hands and feet. What this study does is they compared fatigue across illnesses. And so you can see here that they have common tiredness and sleepiness. Some patients have even been told by their doctors that, oh yeah, everybody gets tired, I get tired, not realizing that their fatigue is quantitatively and qualitatively different. 
So you can see over here, patient, how much fatigue you have with multiple sclerosis, post-polio syndrome, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, hypothyroidism, and depression, bipolar disease, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that the chronic fatigue syndrome symptoms of fatigue are much more severe, and that some patients with the totally disabling chronic fatigue have a symptom severity that is way out of proportion with what other people understand. So the important thing to note is that chronic fatigue syndrome, it's mitochondria, not hypochondria. For those of you who need a refresher on your high school biology, mitochondria are the cell's powerhouses. They take sugar and other nutrients, they burn them with oxygen, and they create energy. So patients with, mitochondria, with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia have mitochondrial disorders. It's more prominent in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. However, recent studies have shown that there's also disordered mitochondria in fibromyalgia. So what makes fatigue pathological? When is it more than just run of the mill? I did an all nighter and I'm tired. Well, there's no reason for these patients to be fatigued. It's unexplained. It's not that they did too much. It's not that they stayed up all night. It doesn't improve with rest. And most importantly, they experience something called post-exertional malaise and worsening of symptoms. And this is what patients call a crash. So when they overdo it, even by a little bit, it's like falling off a cliff. They might be debilitated for a day, two days, a week, and sometimes even longer. And that's why any advice for exercise, or if your insurer, your work is trying to do work hardening, they've made the error of thinking that you're simply deconditioned. They don't realize that there's a limit based on dysfunctional mitochondria. 2015 was a pivotal year for chronic fatigue syndrome, ME. You'll notice earlier when I said, when we looked at the 2013 funding for research and it was $5 million, well, part of the good news was that after this report, it tripled to $15 million, still way under what, what should be allocated to this condition, but at least better than $5 million. This is a quote from the executive summary. It says, seeking and receiving a diagnosis can be a frustrating process for several reasons, including skepticism of healthcare providers about the serious nature of MECFS and the misconception that it is a psychogenic illness or even a figment of the patient's imagination. ME can cause significant impairment and disability that have negative economic consequences at both the individual and the societal level. At least one quarter of ME patients are housebound or bedbound at some point in their lives. And based on the Canadian government census, less than half of these patients are working. And so you can imagine with how common COVID is, and if we truly end up having 10% of patients develop chronic fatigue syndrome, and most of those patients won't be able to work, how economically devastating this will be, not only for the individual with the disorder, but for society as a whole. So what came out of this report? The Institute of Medicine was hired by the uh, NIH, National Institute of Health, to, and it was a group of, of physicians and researchers who were not expert in the area. So what they were looking at is to have some external validation of these diseases. And they suggested a new name. They suggested it be called systemic exertion intolerance disease. So they thought that we should upgrade this from a syndrome to a disease. I think that might have been a bit early. They also suggested new criteria, but you can see that the criteria, which are fatigue, uh, 
post-exertional malaise, unrefreshing sleep, and brain fog or dizziness on standing is a lot less rich than the Canadian criteria that I showed you above. So what happened? The name never caught on. Patients didn't like it. Researchers and physicians in the field didn't like it. The new criteria are being used. They're being found to be good at ruling out disease, but not particularly good at ruling in disease. So most groups are still using the Canadian criteria that were presented above. So if this report didn't change the name and didn't change the criteria, was it really that useful? Actually, it was huge. It was monumental, but not for the reasons that the committee thought. What actually happened is after the report, all of the major journals had editorials commenting on the report. I'm an internist, so this is my journal, Annals of Internal Medicine. And you can see by the title, ME, a real illness. This gives you an indication of what internal medicine specialists around the world thought of ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, prior to this report. So what did the IOM base its recommendation to change the name on? Well, they based it on studies of oxygen utilization. So this looks like a stress test, but you'll notice that this individual is also wearing a mask so that you can figure out how much carbon dioxide that they're putting out, how much oxygen they're using. This is a slide that looks at the relationship between how much oxygen you use and how hard you work out. You'll have seen similar things at the gym where they talk about fat burning zone and training zone, et cetera, et cetera. So here on the y-axis, you have oxygen consumption, how much oxygen I'm using. And on the x-axis, you have how hard you're working out. You work out a little bit, you use a little bit of oxygen. You work out harder, you use more oxygen. You work out harder, you use more oxygen. You work out harder, you use more oxygen. But at some point, there is a maximum amount of oxygen that you can use. And this is the VO2 max. This is the point where you go from burning fuel with oxygen to burning fuel without oxygen. And burning fuel without oxygen is making lactic acid. And so if you compare a marathon runner who can go for hours and you compare a sprinter who can only go for seconds, the reason is you can only go beyond your VO2 max for a short amount of time before enough lactic acid builds up in your muscles that you can't perform. And this is exactly what's happening in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. Here's a study done by Stacy Stevens in California and her group. And what they were really smart at was they looked at two separate days. This is pretty complicated, so I'll take you through one step at a time. So on the first day, they looked at the control group and they said, these patients worked out this hard and used this much oxygen. If we compare them to the chronic fatigue group, they worked out this hard and used this much oxygen. No surprises. Patients with chronic fatigue syndrome were deconditioned. If we had Olympic athletes do this, we would say they worked out this hard and they used this much oxygen. So no new information here. Anybody who's chronically ill will have some problem with deconditioning. The smart piece came when they looked at day two. And you'll remember that if you overdo it, the next day you go into post-exertional malaise. So the goal of the first day was to push these patients into post-exertional malaise and see what happens. You can see that things are relatively the same for the control group. They worked out this much and they used this much oxygen, no significant difference. But if you look at the patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, they dropped their VO2 max. They decreased their ability to use oxygen by more than 
And this is the abnormality that was focused on by the IOM when they suggested the name systemic exertion intolerance disease. A person has an intolerance to exertion. And be clear, exertion is not the same as exercise. For some patients, exertion includes washing your hair and trying to brush your teeth on the same day. So let's look at pain now. And we know that pain is experienced in the head. So when patients ask me, is, it, is the pain all in my head? I say, yes, everybody's pain is in their head. And that's why patients who have spinal cord injuries or patients with diabetes whose nerves aren't working properly have to check their feet every day because their feet don't record injury because the nervous system is not working. Pain is experienced at the level of the brain. So here you can see that there are two types of fibers. There's fibers to send touch information and fibers to send pain information. That information is processed at the spinal cord, processed in the brainstem, and finally experienced at the level of the brain. So what happens with chronic pain? And here we're talking about any kind of chronic pain. We're not just talking about fibromyalgia. These patients develop sensitization and amplification. And sensitization means that it takes less to trigger the pain. Amplification means that the pain is experienced at a higher level at the, at the brain. The other thing that happens is something called the descending pathway is not working properly. And the descending pathway is kind of like an off switch. In patients without chronic pain, this goes down the spinal cord and tells the nerve endings, yeah, we got the message, you can turn down the volume. In patients with chronic pain, this does not happen. So essentially what happens in patients with chronic pain is they have what's called a shift of their pain curve to the left. So let me take you through this. On the y-axis, we have pain sensation. So no pain, ouch, 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 and ouch, ouch, ouch. The higher you go, the more pain you experience. On the x-axis, it's how much I'm hurting you. Here, I'm touching you, it's innocuous. Here, I'm starting to hurt you, and it starts to cause pain. And so when they do these studies, they often just put a clamp on your hand, and they just squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. At first, it feels like touch, and then it feels like pain. And as you squeeze harder, it feels more like pain, and the pain amount goes up. What happens with patients with chronic pain is that this curve is shifted to the left. And so what happens here, you can see, this is how much I'm hurting you, not very much. And it's, you can see on the pain curve, it's not very high. So I hurt you a little bit and it hurts a little bit. Whereas in patients with chronic pain, I hurt you a little bit, but it feels as if I'm hurting you this much. And we call this hyperalgesia, hyper for more, and algesia, like analgesia painkiller, that these patients have more pain with less stimulus or less with hurting them less. And you can see over here that this should be in the touch area. And patients are experiencing pain even in the area where it's innocuous. And this we call allodynia. And that's why some patients with these conditions don't like to be squeezed, don't like to be hugged, because it really hurts. Sometimes it's severe enough that even the weight of their clothing can cause pain. So some people interpreted this study to say, ah, patients with chronic pain are wusses. They're just, they just complain more. Well, it turns out that that's not the case. When I go to court and the lawyer on the opposing side asks me, doctor, pain is, is um, you can't prove how much pain somebody is having. It's subjective. I say no, actually, and they're surprised. What I say is that we can measure pain it's just that the instruments are not widely available. 
is here's a study using functional MRI. And that what they look at here is which parts of the brain are lighting up, which parts of the brain are being used. So over here, we're looking at the same curve as over here, but with fewer data points. So here we have pain intensity, no pain, ouch, 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 ouch. And here they're pretty specific, kilograms per centimeter square. How hard am I twisting the clamp? The squares are patients without chronic pain. And you can see that there's fewer data points, but basically the harder I squeeze, the more it hurts. So here I squeeze a little bit and it hurts a little bit. But for a patient with fibromyalgia, this feels like I'm squeezing about three times as much. And so this is not a perception problem. This is a problem with pain processing. They're more sensitive to pain and the pain is amplified at the level of the spinal cord in the brain. So this is not about being a wuss. This is about experiencing more pain. Another thing that happens in patients with fibromyalgia is problems with blood circulation. So here I'm showing you the red oxygen, oxygenated blood coming from the heart. It goes through the tissue. The oxygen gets taken up by the tissue and the blood goes back to the heart, to the heart, then through the lungs to be reoxygenated. The important part of this diagram are these little valves because these little valves decide how much blood, that means how much oxygen, is being delivered to the tissue. So here's a study done in fibromyalgia, and what they did here is they took a biopsy of the palm. So here it says skin surface. This is a biopsy of the palm of the hand. And so this is the skin. So you can see in the first diagram, that the valve is closed. And so that means the blood gets through the skin and then goes back to the heart. Oops. In the second diagram, you can see that the valve is open. And so the blood bypasses the skin. What's important here are the nerve fibers that open the shunts. Because patients with fibromyalgia have abnormalities in these pain fibers. So here's a study that looked at those, those pain fibers. And what they looked at was how many pain fibers or how much area of pain fiber does a patient with fibromyalgia have compared to the general population? So on the bottom here, this is just by age, so it doesn't matter. And so here it talks about total innervation areas. So how many nerves are supplying that valve? And you can see that in a control, a person without chronic pain, that it's about one. But patients with fibromyalgia have 50, 100, 150, as many as 250 times more nerve endings. And the problem is that with too many cooks giving you messages, you get dysregulation. And so you have problems with oxygen flow. This may be contributing to pain, but it also contributes to the skin manifestations in these conditions. So this is called evanescent hyperemia, hyper too much emia, too much blood flow. And so this looks like a sunburn. When you press on it with your thumb, it goes white and then comes red again. There's no pain. It's just misdirected blood flow. The opposite can happen too, where not enough blood gets in. And this is called Raynaud's phenomenon. And it can occur in the hands or feet. And you, here you can see the toes are blue because they're not getting enough oxygen. Another thing that we sometimes see is called levito reticularis. And le reticularis means lace-like. And so it's a lace-like pattern of the blood vessels on the legs. So in the old days, I used to say that patients with chronic fatigue, ME and FM, had a very complicated disease. We knew a lot about the different pieces, but we didn't know how they fit together. 
So I used to say it's kind of like a house of cards that has collapsed. We can tell you what the individual cards are. I can tell you what some of the problems are with patients with these conditions, but we don't know how they fit together. The good news is that this is changing and we're getting a lot more information. And so now rather than a house of cards that's collapsed, I think of it as a room full of dominoes. And you've probably seen this before where you tip the first domino and it makes all kinds of patterns in the room. This analogy reminds us that stuff that's at the end, if I focus on fixing this, I'm probably not going to have a lot of impact on the overall condition. You want to try and move upstream. And the fur further upstream that you move, the more likely you are to have a significant impact on the condition. And if you can figure out what the first domino is, and stop that from being triggered, you can stop all of the other parts of the illness from being triggered. We're starting to get an idea of where upstream is. And it turns out that it likely involves glial cells. For those of you who have never heard of glial cells, they're the unsung heroes of the brain. You actually have about 80% or more glial cells in your brain rather than brain cells. And so the brain cells that we usually hear about are the neurons. The glial cells don't get talked about. There are a lot of different types of glial cells, but the ones that we're interested in are called microglia. And these are immune cells inside the brain. And so they serve the same function as immune cells outside the brain in protecting from infection and invasion. And you can see that the microglia can release compounds locally, but because they have little feet, they can release compounds into the bloodstream that bypasses the blood-brain barrier. So microglia have, can have an inflammatory effect locally in the brain and more widespread in the body. So here are a couple of papers that talk about this brain glial activation and fibromyalgia. Here's another one, evidence of both systemic and neuroinflammation and fibromyalgia. We know that part of the way that low-dose naltrexone works in fibromyalgia is by reducing inflammatory cytokines. And so when we talk about those molecules, there's a whole bunch of different ones. It's not one thing. And so Patients were, had about a 15% reduction in pain and an 18% reduction in overall symptoms with low-dose naltrexone, and this was associated with a decrease in inflammatory cytokines. The studies weren't done in fibromyalgia with low-dose naltrexone, even though we use it commonly, but we do have a lot of information data that suggests the same process is involved. This article is called Cytokine Signature Associated with Disease Severity and Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Patients. This is a fancy way of saying the higher the amount of cytokines, the, the more severe your symptoms. And so at least from an anecdotal point of view, we're seeing as much improvement in our chronic fatigue patients as we do in our fibromyalgia patients when we reduce the inflammatory cytokines. So here's a paper, and it's a neuroinflammatory model can explain the onset, symptoms, and flare-ups of ME. And so what they talk about is the same thing I talked about at the beginning. There's initial trigger and predisposing factors. This leads to glial cell activation which leads to neuroinflammation. And you have a feedback loop where this can't turn off. And this is like the forest fire. You had the trigger, but now this process has a life of its own. And so part of what happens with the neuroinflammation is that you activate the fight, flight, or freeze response, the autonomic response. And this involves a molecule called CRH, corticotropin-releasing hormone or corticotropin-releasing factors. And so here you can see it's yelling out because of the stress response. So here's CRH 
right here. It's released by the hypothalamus, activates the pituitary, which in turn activates the adrenal glands, and releases the main uh, hormones of the stress response, which are cortisol and adrenaline, noradrenaline. So there's two main features of the stress response. There's an endocrine or hormonal component, which is here. And there's also a component that is directly through the nervous system. Some of you will know the difference between sympathetic adrenaline and parasympathetic. And this is modulated by the vagus nerve. So patients with these conditions, rather than being able to get into health, growth, rest, and digest, are stuck in fight, flight, and freeze. And so some of the symptoms are explained by a abnormally active sympathetic system, a parasympathetic system that is not active enough. So here's what we were talking about, those little feet, the neuro brain immune crosstalk. So here we have our activated microglia. And so these activated microglial cells are unhappy glial cells. And that's why I say taking low-dose naltrexone makes them happy again. It puts the glee back in the glial cell. You can see that the glial cell can act locally, but like we said, the glial cell can release stuff into the systemic circulation, which has a wide number of effects. So let's look at how that might work on the gut. So we have the hormone effect on the gut. Here it's calling for immune cells, these cytokines, these inflammatory molecules. And this is leading to leaky gut. And the leaky gut also causes problem with the gut bacteria, the microbiome. You can also see that the nervous system is involved. We said the vagus nerve is involved in rest, digest, and, re and recover. And so here, the vagus nerve can't make these happy molecules anymore. The inflammatory cytokines are causing problem at the level of the gut, which in turn causes problem with the gut microbiome. And that's why this is called the microbiome gut brain axis. The other name for this is the second brain. So here you can see the inflammatory cytokines. So neuroimmune dysfunction is key to these conditions. Whoops. We start off with glial cell activation, and these unhappy glial cells produce cytokines. They trigger immune activation, both locally and distant. This can lead to problems with dysbiosis, problems with the microbiome in the gut. It can lead to an autonomic nervous system imbalance where you're stuck in fight or flight and the vagus nerve parasympathetic gets turned down and you get pain amplification. So there are a couple of other conditions that are associated with ME and FM and they don't fit into the central sensitivity syndromes. Why they're connected, we really don't know, but we do know just from observation that a lot of patients who are extremely bendy, who are hypomobile, have hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. It's important to know that there are various types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and not all of them are associated with ME and FM. The, the type that is particularly involved is hypermobile type. The problem is that there's no genetic testing for the hypermobile type. So we use a set of criteria, and here you can see the Biden score. This person is able to touch their thumb to their forearm. They're able to bend their fingers backwards 90 degrees. Their elbows and their knees bend backwards and they can easily touch their full palms on the floor. There are other criteria about dislocation, subluxation of joints, pain, etc. 
And for those of you who are interested, Dr. Ma, my colleague, will be doing a presentation on Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And Judith Orban, who is a physiotherapist with an expertise in this area, will be doing a presentation as well. The other condition that's commonly associated with these is something called mast cell activation syndrome. And mast cells are another immune cell in the body. Most of you know mast cells because of their involvement in allergies. So usually what happens is that patients with, um, with these conditions have, with sorry, with allergies, the allergen, so for instance, the peanut allergen triggers the mast cell to release these so-called mediators, which include histamine. And so if you have a massive amount of this, your face and tongue might swell, you might have difficulty breathing, your blood pressure will drop, you can go into shock, and you can even die. On the milder level, you, you will have patients who simply have, you know, and I say simply, it's still distressing, runny nose, red eyes, itchiness, et cetera, et cetera. So mast cells usually degranulate or spit up their histamine and other mediators in response to something you're allergic to. Activated mast cells, what they do is they are bloated, they're full of histamine and other mediators, and they're easily triggered. And it doesn't even need to be a real allergy, it can be something that you're sensitive to. And so patients with these conditions will have a number of symptoms that can overlap with ME that might respond to treatment of either stabilizing the mast cells or antihistamines. So here is a reminder that these conditions are connected to that hypothalamic pituitary axis. The, we talked about this before as the hormonal trigger to the, to the stress response, the endocrine stress response. And, but here you can see that CRH, that screaming molecule, is also involved in triggering the mast cells. And that's why patients with mast cell activation will often tell you that one of their biggest triggers is emotion or stress. Why is this important? Because treating mast cell activation might be another lever that we can pull for improving symptoms. So what are the symptoms? So you can see here when it talks about is mast cell activation and other conditions that it's associated with. You'll see here fibromyalgia, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Gulf War, IBS, multiple chemical sensitivities, chronic fatigue syndrome, post-Lyme syndrome, POTS, post-traumatic stress disorder. And you'll recognize these as either central sensitivity syndromes or the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is associated. In fact, there's a triad of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and mast cell activation syndrome, which is particularly common in patients. You can see here by the list of symptoms, heart, skin, GI, musculoskeletal, nasoocular, neurologic, respiratory, systemic, that there's a lot of overlap with ME and FM. One of the big differences is the dermatologic. So patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia can have those symptoms associated with abnormal blood flow regulation, but they don't get angioedema, swelling of the throat and face, dermatographism, so skin drying. So if you write on somebody's skin, they'll have hives and you'll be able to see what you wrote flushing, itchiness. Also, you tend not to have 
anaphylaxis, which is basically uh, a drop in blood pressure and collapse of the vascular system, but you can get fatigue. So let's come back to family and friends. I often get asked, what can family and friends do to help? Well, I think one of the most important thing is to understand these conditions. This is copied from a shirt that one of my patients wore at a clinic. And I found it hilarious, and so I cop copied it. I especially like over here the guy having his head hit uh, and then thin ice. So realizing that these conditions are real and supporting people, because one of the things that that patients tell me is that having somebody listen, understand, and validate their life experience is one of the more important things that happens when they see me or other doctors who are familiar with these conditions. So what can family and friends do? The important thing here is that many people with these conditions can't ask for help, don't want to ask for help and might even refuse help if you ask them, do you need help? What I would suggest instead is you figure out a way to help them that doesn't take a lot of time on your part. And that might be something as simple as you're making soup and you put one in a freezer container and you bring it to your friend next time you see them. And so that whenever they have a crash and can't get out of bed, that they'll have something healthy to eat. You're already making the soup. Or you're going to Costco and you ask them, can I pick you up a whatever, a case of toilet paper? Or because you're already going, doing this extra thing is not a, that much of an extra effort. But the impact that it will have on your, your family or friends who have these conditions can be huge. We have time for questions, but we won't be posting the questions on YouTube. So I'd like to thank everybody who's come out to support their family or friends and keep an eye, keep an eye out on our YouTube channel for other presentations.